Hi there everyone and welcome back to Higher Biology. We're continuing today with Unit 2, Metabolism and Survival, and we're moving on to Kyria 5, which is Metabolism and Adverse Conditions. So we've spoken before about metabolism or metabolic rate, and previously we spoke about the responses of our body towards changes in temperature through thermal regulation. We're going to expand on this a little bit more. Uh, previously, we talked about conformers and regulators, and we're going to be talking a little bit more uh, about different ways that animals can cope with these adverse or uh, challenging conditions in the external environment. So to start off with, uh, many environments can vary beyond this tolerable limit that we spoke about before for normal metabolic activity. So that tolerable limit is that limit of uh, external conditions that you can survive in. If it goes above or below that tolerable limit, say for example again in temperature, then it's going to be a challenge for you to survive and keep up your metabolic rate. So for example, we have polar bears. You should be thinking straight away of an incredibly cold environment. That's well below the tolerable limits for temperature that we have. But also you can have uh, very hot, very warm, dry desert regions as well which are also on the other scale of that tolerable limit. So we're going to be looking at how these different animals can adapt to survive in these areas. So in terms of these adverse conditions, if you want to survive, you have two choices. You can either adapt to it through uh, different levels of dormancy that we're going to talk about. Hopefully you've came across the word dormancy before. Uh, and the other one is just to avoid it, is to leave. And that would involve migration. And we're going to talk a little bit about migration at the end of this lesson. But first of all, we can have a look at dormancy. So dormancy, as highlighted by the cute picture here, is part of many organisms' uh, life cycle. And it allows survival when that cost of continuing your normal metabolic activity would be too high. So again, we talk about temperature, we can talk about uh, drought, but also in terms of things like winter. Yes, it is cold, but there's also a scarcity of food. So a lot of animals like this mouse, they might struggle to find the nuts and seeds they would normally survive on. So instead of trying to survive through this period, where it's very difficult to find food and the temperature is bad, it could be good to go into dormancy and survive that way. So we're going to talk about different forms of dormancy, but what we're going to really be focusing on is what dormancy does to, again, your metabolic rate and the rest of your body. So dormancy causes a decrease in your metabolic rate. It causes a decrease in your heart rate, and your breathing rate, and also your body temperature. And all of those are related to your metabolic rate. If your metabolic rate is lower, you don't need as much oxygen coming in. There's not going to be as much uh, metabolic activity taking place, so your body temperature is going to be lower, and this is all signs of dormancy. It's almost like you're uh, shutting down slightly to try and survive. So before we go into the three different forms of dormancy, there's two different types that this can first of all be divided into, and you need to know the difference between both of them. Luckily, the name sort of gives it away for both of them. The first one is predictive dormancy. And predictive dormancy begins before the onset of adverse conditions. So before it gets too cold, before there's not enough food. So predictive happens before. Consequential, however, begins after the onset of these adverse conditions. So an organism that uses consequential dormancy would wait until the conditions are bad, effectively, before going into dormancy. So let's compare what both of these are. So in terms of predictive dormancy, uh, as I've said, this happens in advance of any sort of worsening or negative conditions. And this is really common in areas where the conditions are predictable, so you can predict dormancy. So if there's distinct seasons, you might know that winter is coming, and then it means that you're going to go into a state of dormancy. So if you know that roughly around about this time frame, there's going to be a change in the weather, or you can start to sense that it's getting colder, if you think of like autumn going into winter, then you might know this is time for your predictive dormancy to take place. Uh, a really common example of this, of course, is trees. So once the daylight starts to disappear, once the temperature starts to drop, uh, trees know that worsening conditions are coming, and because of that, they can cut off their leaves, a lot of them will then drop their leaves, something that we think very much 
of the autumn season. And it's basically just trees going into a state of dormancy. They know winter's coming, they've predicted this, and they're going to go through dormancy until the spring when the leaf buds uh, effectively wake up again. They come out of dormancy and the tree is still alive, it's just been at a lower rate the whole time. Consequential dormancy though, as I've said, is a little bit different. So that's when an organism becomes dormant in response to adverse conditions. So when the conditions have already hit and then they decide at the last possible moment to go into dormancy. So this is quite the opposite as well because it's common in areas where conditions are varied and they're unpredictable. So there's not a distinct season. So some areas might have a dry season and a wet season that is more difficult to predict. And the example we have here on the right is a lungfish, which is quite a strange organism that lives in certain pools. When the pool starts to dry up because there's a period of drought or there's a period of intense heat leading to drought, it doesn't go into a state of hibernation straight away. It waits until the pool totally dries up and then it produces this sort of cocoon around it to protect itself and goes into a state of dormancy there. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But this longfish has waited until the conditions are so bad that it now needs to go into a dormant state. So just to compare consequential dormancy to predictive dormancy, the advantage of that, for example, for the lungfish, is that the organism can remain active for a much longer period. Because of that, it can take advantage of the resources that are within its habitat, especially if other organisms have went into some form of predictive dormancy. So again, waiting until the last possible second, taking in as much resources as you can from the environment until it's just no longer um, able or it's too challenging for you to survive. The disadvantage of that, however, as you can probably guess, is that it's quite risky. You're waiting to the last possible second, uh, you're not playing it safe by any means. So a sudden severe change in any sort of abiotic factor can kill you off before you have that chance to become dormant. So that is the risk that's involved with consequential dormancy. Now, in terms of both predictive and consequential dormancy, there's also three forms, so three different ways you can go through this dormancy. And they're basically caused by different things. So I'm going to go through them and then we'll go through a little bit more detail uh, before we move on to the next part. But hibernation, you've probably heard of before. Hopefully, when I started to talk about dormancy, your initial idea was, oh, hibernation, I know about that, these sort of things. Now, hibernation is survival in low temperatures, particularly in winter. And that's a standard thing we see with, for example, polar bears hibernating over the winter or over this low period, this period of low temperatures. The second one is the opposite. Aestivation is survival in either drought or high temperatures. So hibernation is cold, aestivation is hot or very, very dry. And the third one, which is a, a different form, is called daily torpor. Now, in terms of the name, this place takes place every day and it's a period of reduced activity. So it's almost a micro dormancy that takes place very often in organisms with a very high metabolic rate. So let's look into these examples here. So again, some more cute pictures for you of animals hibernating, but this is used to survive winter or low temperatures. This can go on for weeks or it can go on for months, but usually it's predictive. So the animal in the lead up to this hibernation, because it's predicting it happening, it knows there's a period of low weather, maybe the, the light starting to shorten, the animal will consume extra food, it'll put on a lot of extra calories, and it's going to put on a lot of extra fat that's going to counter the lack of food over these weeks or months of hibernation. And when the temperatures then get better, they're going to come out of dormancy and they're going to be fine. However, during this hibernation, as we talked about before with dormancy, their metabolic rate is going to drop, their body temperature is then going to drop, and their heart rate and breathing rate is also going to drop. And what this does is it just leads to minimal energy expenditure. It's almost like putting a, a laptop or a TV onto sleep mode. It's still on, it's still running, but it's consuming the lowest amount of energy it possibly can to last for longer. It's the exact same thing with hibernation and with dormancy in general, you're lowering your metabolic rate in order to keep those energy costs to an absolute minimum uh, because you don't want to use up your, your food store and your fat store. 
However, if the external temperature does drop too much, especially in these cold conditions, then the hibernator is able to increase that metabolic rate because you can't let it go like we talked last time about um, regulators and conformers. You cannot let the temperature go so low that you then just die during your period of hibernation. That would not be successful for you. So your metabolic rate can kick in, again, just to try and keep you alive over that hibernation period with the lowest metabolic costs. The second one I spoke about is aestivation. So in this picture here, you might be able to make out a bunch of snails that are all on these posts. Uh, so this is in an area that's very dry, it's very hot, and basically it's going to be too hard for these snails to survive normally in this period of high temperature. So instead what they're going to do is they're going to go into this period of aestivation. This allows survival in these high temperatures or droughts. So for example here, they're going to retreat into their shells, they're going to seal their openings with dried mucus, which just sounds lovely, but they're going to leave a tiny hole that allows them uh, to have gas exchange. Because remember, they're not dead, they are just allowing the lowest possible metabolic rate that they can. So they keep ticking over, they are surviving, but they're able to survive this unfavourable, hot, dry conditions. So it's the exact same really as hibernation, but in hot and dry conditions, as opposed to cold conditions. It's the same with when we talked about the lungfish. That lungfish went through a consequential dormancy, but it also went through aestivation. That was a form of dormancy it took because it was hot and dry and it was having to survive through that condition. And finally, we look at daily torpor. So the hummingbird is a really good example of this. Now, this is a daily period of reduced activity in animals with an enormously high metabolic rate. The idea being that if an animal has an outrageous metabolic rate, it cannot keep going forever. So it needs to effectively shut down at some stage. Now, what will happen is for part of its every 24 hour cycle, it will go into the state of dormancy. As you can see, someone's picking up a, a hummingbird here that's going through its stage of daily torpor. It's going to, again, have slow metabolic rates, going to have slower heart, breathing rate, lower body temperature. Uh, and especially if they have a high surface area um, in which their heat and energy can be lost. But this could take place every day, which just allows them to keep that metabolic rate going for the rest of the, the day where it can go and catch its food and survive normally. Uh, if you, for example, if the hummingbird was not able to hunt at night and there was no food, then it would not be able to keep going with that metabolic rate. It wouldn't have enough food, it wouldn't have enough energy in order to keep its metabolic rate keeping going at that level. So instead of trying to do that, it would just go into its daily torpor. It goes into a state of dormancy, it shuts down until the next day where it can go out and it can eat the food, which can keep that rate going again. So finally, we're just going to briefly talk about the different form of adverse conditions and how you react to it. The second one is just avoiding it, and you avoid these conditions through migration. So migration you'll have heard of before, but in terms of organisms, we are looking at the movement of members of a species over usually a pretty long distance, because you're totally removing yourself from the situation rather than trying to adapt through dormancy. Now, what's important about this, though, is that this avoids what we call metabolic adversity, so struggling to keep your metabolic rate going due to uh, challenging conditions, by expending a lot of energy to relocate to a more suitable environment. So the standard thing, it's too cold, there's not enough food, let's just fly away to a hotter area that's nicer conditions and there's plenty of food for us to eat, rather than going into dormancy and shutting down for the rest of the winter. So the advantage of this is that you avoid those challenging conditions, you avoid that metabolic adversity and the low temperatures and the shortage of food. The disadvantage is that it takes a lot of energy for you to be able to get to a more suitable environment. So it's weighing up what it's worth. Do you try and survive through the conditions or do you put a lot of energy into flying off to a different area? Not always flying, but often it is. Uh, there's two other things that we're going to look at here in terms of more animal behaviour, which we'll discuss a bit more in Unit 3. But in terms of migration, we are studying this on a much bigger level now, which we'll chat about in a second. But there's two ways that animals know how to migrate. The first is something called innate behaviour. And innate behaviour is inherited, is instinctive. So you're born with this knowledge of 
when the temperature gets to a certain point, you fly south, for example. The other one, though, is learned behaviour. And as you can imagine what learned behaviour means, it means you gain this experience by going through migrations, by following the flock you're with, or the other species you're with, or members of your species. And you start to figure out when you have to go, why you have to go, how far, etc, etc. In terms of animal behaviour, migration is thought to be mostly innate, so they have this inbuilt uh, knowledge and inbuilt need to migrate when there's challenging conditions, but it is also influenced by learning through experience, like so many things. So for example, an animal might know when it gets cold, I have to go south, that's innate, that's inherited, that's instinctive within me, but by going along with other members of my species, I found the ideal place to go. So, just so you know the differences between innate and learned behaviour. Now finally, like I said, we are studying uh, migratory behaviour a lot more due to advances in technology. But there's two common ways that we're finding out more about migration, in terms of where animals go um, and when they come back, things like this. And they're through either leg rings or transmitters. Now, the first one, leg rings, are fairly self-explanatory. You may have heard about these before or maybe seen them or got involved with them. But ringing uses metal band with a unique number that gets attached to a bird's leg. So you clamp it on, uh, obviously not in a way that would hurt the bird. And then if that bird is recaptured, you can report that information with that code. So you might know where that bird was tagged, where you found it, what time of year you found it. Things like this that can then be traced back through a database to find out, oh, right, this bird was found in this area, this area, and now back in this area. The other one, the more modern version that's being used, is transmitters. And that's adding a very lightweight transmitter and gluing it to the animal's body or sometimes surgically implanted under the skin. And what that does is it emits signals that then get picked up effectively by GPS. So we are able to, at real time, track where, for example, an eagle or a shark is and we're able to see where their migratory patterns are on Earth by just tracking them constantly, seeing where they go what other animals they meet up with, and things like this. Now, this is giving us so much information now, and we're learning so much more about migration, uh, especially with birds and sea mammals. However, it is very expensive still, using these transmitters, and there are concerns that this could cause drag on, for example, small birds. So you can see on the image there, this eagle has uh, a little transmitter sticking out of its back there, uh, that's been glued on top. The worry is that, first of all, that could cause drag when it's trying to fly. It could also get caught on something. It could also uh, have something that an all eagle could latch onto if they were uh, fighting. So there's different challenges in terms of what to use, uh, and things are changing all the time, but it's up to you to just be aware of what's good about it and what's potentially a negative. And that's all you need for this key area. Hopefully you found it reasonably self-explanatory. Just make sure you know both the different types of dormancy that you can have in terms of predictive and consequential, and then the different forms of each. Remember the difference in hibernation, low temperatures, aestivation, high temperatures, and daily torpor, which is that reduced metabolic activity at once every 24 hours. Uh, also migration, why do animals migrate? Uh, how do they learn to migrate? Do they learn to migrate? And how can we track them? So there's a few ideas that have been thrown in there. Hopefully you found that okay though. Uh, and that is all you really need to be knowing. Uh, so thank you very much, as always, for listening, folks. And I'll put up in the next key area, key area six, where we're getting towards the end of unit two. I know a lot of you are uh, getting through unit two or have finished it already. So hopefully you're finding this useful for your revision. Thanks so much for getting in touch, folks. And I'll speak to you really soon.